All right, we are live and we're back with special guest George Newber talking about the eclipses, answering questions, investigating things. And so uh, it is a great blessing, great mm -hmm. honor. And I want to thank someone for pointing this out earlier. They said, I was previously subscribed, yet today I had to resubscribe twice. Is that right? So make sure you are checking wow. for whatever reason. Couldn't be what we're talking about now. Yeah. Uh, make sure you're subscribed, <laughs> hit the bell, come back periodically and check. Because uh, this is something that seems to happen, I know, for some of my favorite channels. And so make sure you're doing that. Subscribe to George's channel. Uh, the links to his channel are in the description as well as his Facebook. And so if you're interested in the type of stuff he's talking about, I've seen a lot of people have been blessed and a lot of people are really smart and are understanding it. And so, again, don't feel upset if some of the things have been over your head. It's a different language, kind of like science is a foreign language. I tell that to my students all the time when they come to my class for the first time that the hardest part about science is you're learning a new language. And we use a lot of complex words and it's simple stuff, just big words sometimes. This may not be the case, um, but yeah, this is something, it's a learning experience. And hopefully with all the excitement over the eclipse, the world is pushing, it will bring people um, towards this direction, understanding that we're looking at lights and the firmament. It has nothing to do with a globe model. And so that should be um, destroyed today, the, the notion that this is happening on a globe. And so um, we all have different views on this. I'm still, my view on this is still shifting. Talking to George and seeing his evidence um, is helping. I've, I've watched some really brilliant minds have uh, unique perspectives on this. I think Sean Griffin, uh, Kingdom in Context, has a, a unique view with his uh, Babylon series, Investigating Babylon. I have had the pleasure of seeing it in real life when he presented at Flat Toberfest, where I met George. Right. And so I, I got to see the Cliff Notes version, and um, that was that was good. So that was, it was cool to see uh, that perspective of it. So is what's causing the eclipse. That is what this is about. I personally feel um, I'm kind of on the fence with this. Like it could be a sign in the heavens and it could be also something the evil one's doing. It's definitely not um, the narrative that we're given though. That's a hundred percent true. It is not the globe model aspect. And so um, looking into that, um, we know that this is not the case. When the enemy has a lie, they're going to put their sign, their mark, their numbers in there. I don't even like putting this stuff on the screen. I mean, it's it's right. satanic. When they when they take what the Father does, his signs in the heavens, they're going to change it, especially with the lunar eclipse, um, the way that works out, not necessarily the solar, but you can see that representation of a solar eclipse there. Probably very similar with their lunar model that they make up, but it's satanic stuff. Um, but the, the father tells us, you know, some signs are from him. Not everything is evil. We're not saying that you look up at the heavens and um, just everything's from the devil. The father set the lights in the firmament, the stars, the sun, and the moon in the firmament. And so that is the truth um, that we can all agree on. Hopefully, if not now, at some point when we actually see the return and everybody sees it, you know, things will start to get more clear. Uh, but this is a prophecy here in Acts. I wanted to share when we're starting this off. It, we're, it says here, and this is quoting Joel. This isn't just New Testament lingo. This is from Joel where um, that Peter's quoting here in his chapter two of Joel, if you're interested in looking at that, where he says, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great notable day of the Lord. And so, is that a solar eclipse happening, or is he literally turning the sun dark? Um, it's, it's up to, I guess, everybody's interpretation of that. It's like we could look at the Bible, and people see things totally different. Um, and so that's just a verse that has been on my mind with this discussion is mm -hmm. if the enemy is fascinated with solar eclipses and they're not causing them, um, it could be because they're thinking, oh, the sun's going to go dark. We know that's our we know it's going to be one of those times. Maybe that's why they're uh, prepping for Armageddon and doing Operation Steadfast Defender and all that. 
Um, but we have in, in Jeremiah 10, somebody, a subscriber in the comments said this to me this morning. And, it, um, and I, so I put it up here. It says, thus saith Yahuwah, learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of, of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them. You know, they had false gods for different constellations. They were all upset over mm -hmm. these different things that were going on. Don't be worried with all these events, with what CERN is doing, with what the news is telling you. Do not be upset. OK, the father is our protector. We are his children. Um, don't be dismayed. Don't be scared. <laughs> don't let the, the fear get to you and start doom prepping and hoarding up on a bunch of supplies. Unless the father tells you to do something, then then you do it. Um, let's see. There's that word, that word sign that it was talking about earlier in that verse. I added this. So this was back to that uh, book of our verse in Acts that it's a sign, a miracle, an indication or a mark or a token. Mm -hmm. Let me see. There you go. Um, there's a lot of verses about the sun going dark and in prophecy. It's not usually talking about, I don't think, an eclipse. In, in my opinion, it's about the end, that it's last that. sign there. Yep. Um, Isaiah talks about it. The stars of heaven and the constellations, therefore, shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. I mean, kind of sounds a lot like a solar eclipse. Um, because those things do somewhat happen, but the sun is still shining. It's just being partially blocked there. So it's not actually the sun going dark. So that doesn't fit the description. Right. Um, and then in Joel again, chapter three, the sun and moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining, which I find that fascinating. Enoch talks about the stars representing our righteousness, the righteousness of the elect. That's why you can barely see these things. Um, and so, when we're gathered together, the stars not giving their light just makes a lot of sense to me. And then uh, Zephaniah, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness in Ezekiel, um, where it says, And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, not with a black disk, with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. So that kind of gives more of an answer there in Ezekiel, what's causing the darkness. And so um, if the eclipse were to be some sort of uh, sign, or miraculous sign, I'm not saying it is, but if it was, um, it would make sense as to why they're trying to predict them and focus on them and obsess over them and do all the things they're doing. And because that's when Armageddon would follow soon after with Operation Steadfast Defender that NATO literally just had 90,000 troops or more, you know, gathered for a near peer threat in the land near where Armageddon is. And Armageddon is owned by uh, the United Nations. Yep. So done a video about that. Not going to talk about that. I don't want to take away from George's presentation on this. Just thought that information was fascinating given the events that are about to happen. And they're acting like they, they've got the, um, what is it? Uh, National Guard on standby, ready. And here we go. Uh, we just had Steadfast Defender right there, and I got on the map where you can see Armageddon is and the Euro-Atlantic area where they're preparing for this threat. Very close, very close to home. Um, I mean, obviously, they're they're ramping it up, and the UFO threat and all that stuff is still um, near and dear to their heart. Yes. So interesting times. Um, again, just a recap of stuff we talked about before. NASA's, you know, People say it's not a religion that they follow, but they follow NASA. NASA has their religious deities with every mission, and this is no different. The Eclipse, they have their serpent deity, the encircler of the world, um, the enemy, the serpent, you know, the serpent of rebirth, they call it. Uh, they have their mission on that day, three rockets, and you can see this thing is it's just like their serpent tongue in their logo that many people have pointed out that twisting serpent. And uh, my wife found this in the, in the book of Isaiah. Again, it talks about that piercing serpent. It says in the, in Isaiah 27, in the day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, that piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. And so you look up those words and instead of crooked, it says fleeing. And that word fleeing, when she looked that word up, what does that mean? I mean, we obviously know that means to leave, but it says of Eclipse Dragon in the uh, Brown Driver Briggs um, 
definition. So I don't know where they got that information from, uh, but it's fascinating that we now have that Eclipse Dragon um, mission, Serpent Deity. And also, uh, depending on how you do your calendars, my wife and I this, this year have done things a little differently. Um, studying out Passover when it is, using the different calendars that, you know, the Zadok calendar and um, our last day. This doesn't match with everybody's. Every, they really know most people, I think, will be the next day. Um, the day of the eclipse was actually what we considered our last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, most of you know, when the crucifixion happened, they had already had their last, you know, the Passover meal and all of that. And so it happened around this time. I'm not saying it was April 8th, um, but when he was crucified, the sun did go dark. Um, I'm not saying it was an eclipse. A lot of people seem to believe that. Um, like we saw in Ezekiel, there was a thick cloud. And you know, the father, when this is happening, the 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 agony. And we were talking about this. I see uh, Dennis and Debbie in the chat talking about this today during our word study. And, you know, the father turning his back. You know, he cannot watch your child. This happening to your beloved son. There's going to be darkness. And so it was, it's the saddest thing, but the, the mystery of what would happen was hidden from the enemy for a reason. Yes. And it, it, it's powerful, the events that have taken place since, um, since the resurrection. And so extremely powerful, extremely prophetic, um, a significant time. Let's see if I can get my slides to change here. There you go. And so from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, it went dark during that crucifixion and from about the sixth hour to about the ninth hour, that eclipse is going to last. Again, I'm not saying this was the same thing that happened that day. Just fascinating. If this is from the enemy, mimicking what's already happened. You've got those significant places, which is kind of what made me wonder, is this from the enemy? The fact that it is like Salem, the Nineveh connection, all the different paths. Um, definitely not something that works on a globe. Unique stuff. And I saw this meme. I thought you would like this, George. It was um, on Facebook today. Shadows mm -hmm. don't do this. And they had the moon because the moon, according mm -hmm. to their model, is about as wide as the United States, if I'm not mistaken. It's and so right. the shadow doing that, I mean, it's hard to imagine in their version of creation, the moon being that big, leaving a shadow that small. It just seems impossible. Right. And when we have a lunar eclipse that scale that shifting that triangulation <laughs> where that shadow gets smaller it doesn't happen you don't see a reduction in the sizes whatsoever so i these are some things i was looking at this morning and um just looking at the math i mean no it doesn't take a mathematician to see there's a problem with these two different contrasting scenarios with the shadows um there's their little image of how it works you know, suspended in space, the pale blue dot. Well, that one that you showed that had a, like a pinpoint cone. Yeah, that that is what's happening. We'll talk about it tonight, but it's it's called the cone of perception. Yeah, cone of perception. So somebody looking up, that's the cone of perception that you're going to see. Yeah. Yep. And, and here's one last. This is one thing I thought was pretty cool was when I was looking up eclipses and I was looking up their paths. I was looking at how wide they are near the edge of the world, you know, near Antarctica, and they're massive. They're many times thicker than they are when they're going over the U.S. When they're going over the U.S., they're, they're very narrow. You can see it's just very thin. And down there at the bottom of a ball, allegedly, they're really wide. Well, if it's a sphere, the math is going to work the same on the top. The, yep. the lines that you see on the top of the sphere are going to be wide like that as well. And you can see going through Greenland and Iceland, they're not. They're the same thickness and so you can practice that you can try that on a spherical object the, the shadows will get actually thicker on the bottom if you have the, everything out the way it would work on a globe model but it would be equal on the top and on the bottom it would not differentiate it's going to be the same in my opinion uh, based on what i've done with just a cell phone flashlight and a, a giant yoga ball you can do those if you have a spherical object you can replicate that or a globe mm -hmm. and um what you're seeing in this picture doesn't match up to the globe model because again, it's not just a ball on one side. It's a ball on every, everywhere you go. It's a sphere. Right. And then um, for people who have never looked into this, there's the Selenelian eclipses uh, when it comes to the lunar, not the solar, but the lunar eclipses where you can see the sun and moon above the horizon. And they're still 
an alleged earth curve shadow showing us that it has nothing to do with the curvature of the earth. And not only that, I mean, artists, anyone who's into painting can tell you the light coming off the moon is not the light coming off of a rock. Oh. There's so many different ways to disprove that. Yeah. Um, and just pictures, just photography, comparing them, you can tell that is not a rock in the middle of a vacuum reflecting that light. It's giving off its own light. It's a cold light. It's different. Um, and then you have the, the last thing here. A lot of people concerned about CERN. Don't be. Uh, like we said earlier, at the start of this, the father is in control. There's a reason in Revelation when, the, when you know, with the fifth seal, there's that aspect of you're not going to hurt the ones that are sealed for the most high. And we have his protection. We're going to be persecuted um, and we're not going to have rewards that we can't lose, but it's not like all this destruction is going to happen and his children are going to be unprotected. And so um, they're doing it on April 8th. Um, going way back 120 years ago, Aleister Crowley did his demon summoning thing on April 8th to come up with his bogus book of the law where they're mimicking the most high's actual book of the law that's in the Bible that it talks about. Um, so 120 years ago, they were doing this. So CERN is nothing new. They're trying to do these things. Um, they're not going to do some sort of space-time continuum, time travel, anything like they put in Hollywood. It's all for evil, sinister purposes, but they can't do stuff beyond what they're allowed to do. They can't speed up uh, the book of Revelation. They can't do it. And so um, don't be dismayed at the signs in the heavens. This is not something to scare you guys. Hopefully, um, you understand that it's it's a time to learn, come together and just look at how this stuff falls apart when you try to use the worldview that we used to have, how this does not work on a globe. There's um, and, and a lot of the math that George is doing will will show that and has shown that. So we're thankful for him to be here. I'm going to let him um, take over with his presentations and share some things. And if you guys have questions, he's willing to answer um, yes. after it's over or even during it. Sometimes if I see a question, I might ask if there's a chance. Um, with some of the stuff, but we appreciate you guys joining us, moderators yeah. in the chat. You guys are a blessing, and we thank you for all your hard work. It does not go unnoticed, even though we may not say thank you every time you're <laughs> keeping people in line. Um, it's a major blessing. So, um, again, George Newber. Thanks, John. In the house. Appreciate you uh, having me on the third time in a week. It's yeah. pretty amazing. It's a record. Um, I don't know if you got the uh, presentation, the PDF. There's one PDF that needs to be loaded up, but this won't be as long as the other ones, and it won't be as mathematical as well. There'll be some, but not like the first two are. But you know, people say people are smart, and my answer to that is I'm not smart. I'm just trying to search for truth. Oops. You know, and when I'm searching for the truth. The Father is giving me insights that I've never seen before. You know, and so He's the one that's doing it, not me. He's just using me as a conduit. That's why I have to share it. I have to share the truth because he's given it to me. And this is all part of the kingdom of God. It sets up the kingdom of God. People better has a better understanding of where we live, what's above us. And so it can make more sense. And it's not mystical or a mystery. Um, so it's taken me two years and I'm still learning. I'm always learning about the navigational data. Two years to figure it out. A year and a half to finally realize you know, how the whole circular level plane worked as far as latitude and longitude. Uh, so, and a lot of that too, I was watching pretty much all the series from Sean Griffin investigating Babylon. So yes, my, my end out of all the research is I agree with what he's showing. Okay. Uh, but uh, let's go start, start the, start the presentation. All right. Is it this one, first one right here. Yep. Yep. So this is uh, going to be part three of what's what we've been doing so i'm going to go back again i mean each start of each presentation i'm going to talk about the surface of water is always level it doesn't bend or curve it's just a geometric geometric nature which yahweh did for his creation so this is the third time because i've presented the first time we'll go to it now the first part uh i'm using these two uh locations on the web Basically, one is a topographic map that tells you what the elevation is above sea level anywhere on, on the Earth. The second is a map that tells you the distances between one point to the other. So you can do this anywhere. Anybody can do this themselves. Just get on these two uh, websites together, put them in different windows, and then 
you know, click on where you want to go from distance to distance from one ocean to the other ocean and then get on the topographic map and see what the elevation of the water is at those two locations. It's going to be zero because the surface of water is always level. Um, so I'm going to reshow this. This is in part one that Lake Michigan's south to north distance is over 300 miles. You can see the distance there from uh, north to south. It shows that it's 321 miles. Then here's the surface elevation point for the south location. On the south end, it's 575 feet above sea level. Then who we have it on the north side, 575 feet. So it's level all the way across, which means the whole shoreline on that perimeter shoreline on that lake is at the same level. It doesn't bend or curve. So when we look at the data compared to what, you know, the circular level plane Earth, we know it's flat, but with the globe, because of the geometry of it, uh, as it says, that according to the size of the Earth's sphere at a distance of 300 miles requires the Earth to have 11 miles of curvature. There is none of that there. None. So hopefully the people's cognitive dissonance will start realizing that you can't have it's not a level surface at all when you have a curved surface, especially when you're down underneath. If it was truly a ball, you're totally upside down. It just doesn't work out. And this, this geometric law of water just proves it. Then on part two, I decided because we had some comments, oh, there, you know, there's, it's not level. So I'll, go, I'll do the big picture now, ocean to ocean across multiple distances. Uh, so the distance between the Delaware Bay and the Southern Ocean location point on the globe map is 6,348 miles. You can see that highlighted there, the distance. So that did the same thing. And by the way, this is a same lat uh, longitude line here. I did this on purpose to show that the latitude distances on both the circular level plane map and the globe map, which is curved, is the same. They just, they just took a straight line and, and made it a circle for the outer circumference of the uh, globe Earth. Um, and here it is shown on the Gleason's map. Um, same, it's the same distance, 6,348 miles. And you can see first on the map, you can see where it's going from Delaware Bay all the way to the tip, just to the uh, side of uh, South America. And so how you can calculate it is it's known that uh, the distance, degrees distance from latitude to latitude is an actual distance measurement. So up where it's at the Delaware Bay, the latitude's farther north from the equator. It's a plus 39 degrees. And then the latitude, the latitude degrees down south from the equator is minus 53. So you add those two together, you get 92 degrees of latitude distance. So for both, both maps are the same as far as latitude distance, uh, degrees, distances per degree in miles. It's 69 miles per degree of latitude. So all you got to do is uh, multiply 92 degrees of latitude times 69 miles per degree of latitude, you get exactly 6,348 miles, okay? So this time with the big picture, uh, the second bullet here, the spherical globe requires the surface of the Earth to curve no, more than more than 7, 3,700 miles, which is huge. It's more than, it's almost a 90 degree curve on the, on the Earth if it was a globe, okay? This cannot happen. And so this rock solid proves that this entire circular area of water here is contained by the Antarctica perimeter ice wall and then contained by the shorelines of all land mass areas. Okay. The, tonight, I'm going to do a small scale now. This is going now to a lot smaller distance for I'm going to use my Nikon camera at, on Myrtle Beach right on the shoreline and uh, look at a spot. I'm going to go from one pier to the next pier, and these piers are seven miles apart. And um, so to do this, I had to basically, you know, change the tables for the curvature because I'm actually up six foot above sea level when I get real close to the ocean because the tripod's about six foot above where it's sitting. Uh, so this table basically um, tells you curvature distances with the camera at six foot above sea level, which I'll be right on the shoreline. So when you come down here to seven miles, this tells you that seven miles away, the curvature should be 10 foot, a little over 10 feet, which means I shouldn't be able to see the shoreline, right? Um, so what I'm going to do now is to just show you, I actually, instead of using the calculations, this lower graph here is 
part of my AutoCAD that I use to get the true geometrical um, distances because it's perfect geometry. I literally had a circle that was the diameter of the earth and then started marking off certain miles from the center of it to get the different distances from the viewpoint. So you'll see this here. Uh, play, can you play video one, the Myrtle Beach video, Josh? Yeah, yeah let me see. It should show the, uh, the tripod on it. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, there you go. Now we will use a Nike. That one? On P1000. That sounds like the camera yep. to test the Earth's surface curvature at a distance of seven miles. A Nikon P1000 camera can magnify 125 times and take pictures and videos 20 miles away. But first we need to adjust the curvature distances due to the height of the camera above ground level. Based on a camera height of six feet above ground level, the table shows curvature distances based on the following AutoCAD video. So here we're back in AutoCAD again, and the long lines is the 4,000 mile radius of the Earth going out to the curvature. So we're zooming in. You can see that the camera height's at six feet. It comes in there, and we're gonna zoom in to show the actual, there it is, six foot above curvature. And then we're gonna just click on there so you can see that it says it's six feet. So you able to see that, John? Yeah, that's cool how far you can zoom in on this program and zoom right. out. Wow. Yeah. And now we're going to go back out and show what the uh, height is above the curvature for one mile, because now we'll be able to see above it. It's two foot eight inches at one mile above the Earth's curvature, theoretically. Then at two miles, it's eight inches above. And at three miles, it's zero. Then at four miles, it's eight inches below. At five miles, it's two feet, eight inches below. At six miles, it's five foot 11 inches below. And seven miles is 10 foot eight inches below, which is where we're gonna be. So as we keep spanning out towards the 90 miles of curvature, you'll see the uh, distances go higher and higher of the curvature distance below the line of sight of the camera. Now we are going to bring up the topographic map and map distance calculator websites again. In Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, there are two piers which are 7.16 miles apart from each other. Here's a Myrtle Beach topographic map and the map distance calculator. I'm going to zoom in on the map distance calculator to locate Pier 14. And there it is right there. I'm going to mark that as a point on the map. So you got that point. And we're going on the topographic map to locate Pier 14 and check the uh, surface level of the water, which we know should be zero feet. There it is. And the surface level is zero feet, which is sea level. Now on the distance calculator map, we're gonna go and find the Apache Pier, which is 
a little over seven miles north of Pier 14. So we got our mark and it shows it's 7.16 miles in distance. So that's where I'm going to set the camera up on Pier 14 looking north, the Nikon camera. Locate that pier. Now we'll go back over to the topographic map. To see what the elevation is going to be at the Apache Pier, which we by now we would know it's going to be zero feet because it's at sea level. The surface of the oceans are at sea level, zero feet. And there it is, zero feet. This is Pier 14, and I used my mobile phone to show where I set up the Nikon P1000 camera, which is right at the shoreline and looking north toward the Apache Pier. I lowered the legs of the tripod so that the camera height above the surface of the water would be six feet. This is video from the Nikon P1000 camera looking north. I slowed the video so we can see the shoreline better as the camera zooms out to find the Apache Pier. The shoreline is clearly visible as we continue to zoom out toward the Apache Pier. The wind was between 10 to 17 miles per hour that day, which makes it hard for the camera to stay in focus, especially when zooming farther out. Yeah, the wind really plays up big roll yeah. and long yeah, distance yeah. footage at the beach. I was trying to wait for it to calm down. The shoreline down. at the Apache Pier is seven miles from the camera. Based on the spherical the earth, here. the shoreline at the Apache Pier should be 10 foot below the site of the camera. However, the shoreline is clearly seen at the Apache Pier and beyond the pier. This again proves the surface of the oceans are level and the earth is yeah, not spherical in shape. Wow. Yeah. That, so that, yeah, I mean, you know, the all different distance locations, wherever you go, it's always flat. The level water, surface of the water is always level and flat. So we had talked about a compass, how that works and needs to be level. I got a short video there too. Uh, it shows the compass just to show that one to, uh, I use a beach ball to make the point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me see. I think Matt was telling me about this one. Oh, not that one yet. Nope, not that one. Sorry. Yeah, the next one. Yeah. Sorry, I thought yeah. I clicked that one. There Here I've placed my compass, which has a bubble level on top of a countertop. We can see by the bubble level that the countertop is level because the bubble is centered within the eyeglass circle. Since the compass is level, the compass needle is able to move freely to locate magnetic north. As I rotate the compass clockwise, the magnetic north needle stays pointed to magnetic north because the compass is level. Next, I will place the compass on a beach ball 
which represents a spherical Earth, to see how the compass functions to find magnetic north. Here is a beach ball which represents a spherical Earth. I place the compass on top of the beach ball which represents the North Pole of a spherical Earth. As I keep the compass level by using the bubble level, we observe the magnetic north needle is free to rotate and finds magnetic north. When I place the compass on the side of the beach ball, which would represent the equator on a spherical Earth, the compass is 90 degrees vertical from being level. We observe the bubble is at the top of the eyeglass circle. The magnetic north needle is no longer free to rotate, but rather rotates along with the movement of the compass, resulting in the compass not being able to find magnetic north. When I move the compass back up to the top of the beach ball, I am able to level the compass, and the compass then finds magnetic north. When I place the compass on the bottom of the beach ball, which would represent the South Pole on a spherical Earth, the compass is 180 degrees upside down from being level. We observe the bubble is at the top of the eyeglass circle. The magnetic north needle is no longer free to rotate, but rather rotates along with the movement of the compass, resulting in the compass not being able to find magnetic north. Navigation using a compass proves Earth is a circular level plane. A compass requires the compass needle to be level to freely rotate to locate magnetic north. Anyone using a compass anywhere on Earth to navigate is able to locate magnetic north once the compass is level. However, a spherical Earth is only level at the North Pole. All other locations going south from the North Pole are between 1 degrees to 180 degrees at a level. The equator is 90 degrees out of level or perpendicular to the North Pole. The South Pole is 180 degrees out of level or upside down to the North Pole. Therefore, since anyone using a compass anywhere on Earth to navigate is able to locate magnetic north, the compass proves that Earth is a circular level plane with north located at the center of Earth's circle. They are navigating on a circular level plane and they just don't know it. That's the truth. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. I remember looking into compasses and seeing that meme where it's like, it only works when it's held flat. And I'm like looking up the globe, you know, going back to elementary school when they were showing me this sphere with just lava in the middle. And, right. and I'm like, wait a minute, do magnets even work when they're heated up? Because they tell, they told me it was like a bar magnet going through a ball. And I was instantly find a video of a magnet being heated up and not working. So I'm like, wait, so you heat up a magnet, it doesn't work. But our magnetic field is like a bar magnet going through a sphere. Right. And I was like, why is no one questioning <laughs> that narrative when it, it just makes sense to me that right. a compass works best. And then I saw, you know, in the early days, David Weiss had that map and he circumnavigated with a magnet in the middle of the north, you know, where the North Pole is. He circumnavigated and the compass pointed north the entire time when it was flat. And I remember thinking, yeah. That's what I was told proved I lived on a globe. That scenario there, a boat going in a circle. And you can even do that on a globe. Like you can go to the close to the North Pole on a on a if it was a globe, you know, and circumnavigate right. in circles. You're not that's not proving that it's round, but when you get further away it does. Yes, <laughs> you just right. gotta be far enough away and that proves it. Uh right. so yeah, the, the magnet, uh the compass was a big one for me early on, realizing we're just navigating a flat circular plane. Right. And if you were, if it was a sphere, 
and you were at the bottom at the South Pole, guess if it would even work, guess where it would point to? To the ground. To the ground. <laughs> yeah. It point through, through the north, right, if it worked. So let's we'll go back to the PDF presentation now for a little bit. Okay. Let's see. That one? Yes. Yeah, that's it. So, you know, based... The, the, the basic geomet geometric law that the surface of water never bends or curves is the only thing you need to do and know that the hel heliocentric model is false and a lie by Satan, the deceiver of the world. That's all you need to do. I mean, because no longer is it a globe spinning. It's, it's level. You know, it can't spin if it's level. Um, so the foundation of the heliocentric model is that the Earth is a counterclockwise spinning sphere orbiting around the sun. However, through scientific observation, testing, and repetition, the Earth is a circular level plane, resulting in all aspects of the heliocentric model to be false and a lie. The Earth is fixed and immovable. The firmament slash bearer slash heaven is above the Earth to maintain air pressure and oxygen levels for life on Earth to exist. The sun, moon, and stars are luminaires slash lights, which rotate clockwise within the firmament barrier or heavens above the Earth's firmament barrier. Almighty Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, and there is no vacuum of space. I mean, just just this level water knocks all the stuff out that the heliocentric model tells you. You don't have to do anything else except know that, know that truth. Um, so we're going to talk about the rotating earth and possibility. So this graph, most people, if you ask most people, they don't know. They, they, they say, oh, yeah, the earth's spinning clockwise. But if you ask them, how fast is it going at the equator? They don't know because they don't really, they're not interested. Um, so this shows you the cut through with the, at the latitude lines, what's going on. It, at the equator, it's 1,035 miles per hour that's going, okay? Because it's what it takes to get rotate once in 24 hours. So when you start going you know, 15 degrees latitude south or north, it slows it down because the, uh, the diameter of that latitude line on this, in that part of the circle is less. And as you keep going farther down, then you're on 900 miles per hour, 732, 518, 206. And of course, when you get to the bottom, you're just kind of standing there, la, 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 you know? <laughs> uh, so this is the latitude surface speeds due to rotation, quote, rotation. Uh, so the clock, counterclockwise rotation ranges from 518 miles per hour at latitude 60 degrees to 1,035 miles per hour at the equator. The speed of sound is 746 miles per hour, so that's hauling pretty well. And not only that, but the commercial airlines cruise around 550 miles per hour, so something's wrong here. Uh, especially now that we know that's a false look uh, geometry of the Earth. Since the Earth is rotating, quote, rotating, at these enormous high speeds, you have to think about it. Earth's air at ground level also needs to rotate with the Earth at the same speeds because there are many instances where no wind is felt or observed. We see it all the time. We go outside, it's calm, there's no wind. Next thing we have a little breath of air go one way, then the other way. So that in itself, well, doing that tells you something's not right either. I mean, with if this Earth's moving that fast, the wind would have to go along with it. So if the wind did not rotate along with the Earth, no life structures or trees would exist on the Earth due to the surface wind shear of 518 to 1,035 miles per hour. Just think, you know, hurricanes that go between 74 to 185 miles per hour, uh, you know, do such damage to structures and properties, but that's nothing compared to the wind shear of, quote, a re uh, rotating earth. So this pretty well makes it impossible in that aspect of it where you can go outside and you can sit there and it's like, there's no wind, but then you feel the wind breath of wind going east or west, it swirls north or south. It totally discounts the, the earth rotating but just because of that. Um, basic, you know, kind of logical thinking. However, life structures and trees do exist. So if the earth is rotating between 518 to 1030 miles per hour, then the air at the surface of the earth must be moving with the earth between the same <laughs> speed, right? This would be called Earth's west to east background surface airspeed. That's what I would call it. But do you ever hear that from anybody? 
No one ever describes this phenomenon, not the weather channels. They won't go, yeah, the weather today, the wind's going this way. <laughs> Even though the background speed is 518 or 1,035 miles per hour, they never say anything like that. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's not there. Uh, and not the airline pilots either. Oh yeah, we're coming. The winds are pretty good. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to go against this uh, wind shear of 518 miles per hour. Like, if they tried to do that, they would go nowhere. Yeah. And I noticed with the news too, when they're doing weather, they added a few years back the curvature of the earth when they're showing you the weather patterns. Used to, right. it was just a flat map with, you know, yeah. the radar from the ground picking up the clouds moving by. And now it's like you always see the earth curvature on the weather channels now with the globe model. They just emphasize that like out of nowhere. They started doing yeah. that. As soon as we started testing the globe, they started increasing the programming. Yep. And getting, yeah. And there were people getting smarter about it. So. Um, so this background surface airspeed between 518 to 1035 miles per hour is always blowing west to east will prevent the falling actions, which always occurs. And we observe days when the air is totally calm or still, and then a slight breeze swirls to the west or any other direction in just a few seconds. And then commercial airlines flying northwest or southwest at a speed of 550 miles per hour reach their rest westerly destinations <laughs> without delay, you know. So uh, very simple way to prove that, you know, if you thought about it, spinning, how that's impossible to do as well, because our winds would not be as calm. They wouldn't, you know, on a circular level plane, no movement. And so that's how we can have all different types of winds, any speeds and directions occurring at any time. Therefore, the Earth is fixed and non-rotating. So now we're going to talk about the Earth's air. Air is primarily consists of two gases. It's 78% nitrogen and 20.9% oxygen at sea level. The air pressure at sea level is 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch. Wow. Sea level is a perfect elevation for the human body to live due to the highest concentration of 20.9% oxygen in the air. The higher elevation above sea level, the less dense the air becomes and the oxygen concentration in the air is reduced. By the way, you know, when people talk about they get they get aches, you know, their joints hurt, they don't feel good when the low pressure comes in. That's mm -hmm. because the pressure on their body is less and now their body expands some because the pressure isn't counteracting uh, our pressure. OK, wow. um, so here's just a table that shows you altitude, altitude above sea level, starting at zero feet and up to 250,000 feet, what the air pressure is and then the oxygen percentage. OK. Uh, and then, you know, we'll get to what these really mean as far as health for uh, the human body and things like that right here. Air's oxygen concentration limits altitudes where humans can live. The safe oxygen levels from humans to, for humans to sustain normal functions, the percentage of oxygen required to sustain life according to, well, this is government, OSHA is between 19.5% and 23.5%. Not enough oxygen side effects. Oxygen concentrations from 19.5% to 16% cause the body cells, cells to fail to receive oxygen needed to function correctly while doing physical activities. Oxygen concentrations from 14 to 10% result in impaired mental functions, intermittent respiration, and body exhaustion at any amount of physical activity. Humans won't survive with oxygen levels 6% or lower. Most of the world's populations live on coastal plains with altitudes of 500 feet or less. That's 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 a data point I didn't know until I started researching this. Wow, makes sense. Well, yeah, where oxygen concentrations are at safe slash healthy levels between 20.9% 20, 20. and 19.6. Rivers are a perennial source of water for drinking, bathing, and farm irrigation. That's why we kind of stay on those low areas, okay? Land near rivers are fertile for growing crops and raising farm animals. Rivers provide transportation routes for selling goods. There, you are, there's a group of people though that are in Tibet. They live at elevation 17,500, which is way up there. Wow. It, it, it comes too cold around above that for growing crops. And there's not enough uh, air or oxygen for humans to sustain, you know, be able to live up there. It's like kind of an interesting thing to look at as far as, you know, air and, percent of oxygen as you go up in elevation. So Earth's sky, how high? The higher the elevation above sea level, the less dense the air becomes and the oxygen 
oxygen concentration in the air was reduced. So here's some data points. 42,000 feet above sea level, that's eight miles, is the limit of commercial airlines cruising altitude. 60,000 60, feet, 11.4 miles, air pressure is at 1.69 PSI with 0% oxygen in the air, 11.4 miles up. And there's no combustion with standard jet engines there. Pressure suits are required for pilots to prevent bodily liquids from boiling. Uh, they found that out once they started going to that, that elevation that literally the uh, fluids like uh, urine and uh, blood would come out through the skin. So what they do, they had to have a suit on to pressurize the suit so that that wouldn't happen. Basically, it's almost like your, your, your uh, fluids are, are boiling out is what it says here. Wow. So at 67 miles, it's 354,199 feet. Here's some... Uh, records that I found. August 22nd, 1963, X-15 rocket crossing the Carmen line the first time. Air pressure is zero or at a vacuum state. Notice it says rocket. So they can't have an engine. So what they were doing, they had basically a, a plane, you know, it was carrying this rocket and they get to a certain elevation and they would still have the pilot, so to speak. He's not really piloting it, but he's just driving it now. That rocket would get enough speed and, and distance capability to go up higher. Okay, once it already had used its combustion because it had to do it lower, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the first time we're learning about a Carmen line at 67 miles. Mm -hmm. And then I found another one. This is interesting 367,000 feet, about 69.6 miles, not much higher than the previous one. October 4, 2004. Here we go, Spaceship One. <laughs> crossing the Carmen line. And again, the air pressure is zero in the vacuum. It's in a vacuum state. But this is, okay, what's a Carmen line? You know, so that's the next slide. Carmen line, separating Earth's sky from space. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the, this, the Carmen line is an, invis it's an invisible boundary that's used by some to delimit where the Earth's sky ends and space begins. And this Carmen line was established in the 60s by FAI. It has been used by members, countries, and organizations affiliated with FAI as one of the definitions of space. The FAI definition of the Carmen line is around 62 miles above sea level, which, you know, now we can say, well, you know, that could be getting close to where the firmament is, if there, you know, since we know there's a barrier. So, but wait a minute. If there is no physical boundary between the Earth's sky and space, then the Earth would be a vacuum with no sky no air pressure, no oxygen, and no human life, okay? Yep. It just, it, here we go with, you know, thermo, uh, thermodynamic laws. Yeah, gravity knows where that Kármán line is. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we just debunk gravity because we know that the Earth's flat it can't, and it doesn't rotate. And yeah. That's why they use gravity from that. Second so, law, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying it's so cool how all these things work. Like you were talking earlier during our study about the electric charge they increase as you go up i saw a guy doing that with a drone and right testing how the charges are more positive as you get higher and negative yep. as you get lower yep fascinating that's the, ether. that's the ether that yahweh created everything through it's amazing so the second law of thermodynamics states gases at different pressures will always combine to an equilibrium pressure with no boundary between the earth sky and space and this is, you got to think about this. Okay, so they say space is an infinite, infinite, right? Infinite size. So the zero PSI, 0% zero oxygen vacuum of the, quote, infinite volume of space, unquote, will combine with the 14.7 PSI, 20.9% 20 oxygen of the very, I should have said, very, very, very limited volume of Earth's air to an equil equilibrium pressure of zero PSI, 0% zero oxygen, uh, zero PSI in vacuum of space and there'd be no life on earth. So if you look at that, I mean, there'd be nothing here existing. There'd be no life. However, the fact that the earth's air always has been here and it will be here with 14.7 PSI with 20.9% oxygen at sea level proves a boundary or barrier does exist above the earth's sky. So we're going to do a test, a test with two vacuum chambers, both the same volume of about two gallons and a vacuum pump can prove there is a boundary slash verb above the Earth's sky by using the second law of thermodynamics. So this is a picture. I'm going to show the picture to set it up before we show the video. But 
uh, you can see that these two chambers, one, the lower one, I call it the chamber number, number one, Earth's air. It's got two valves. The one on the right is the outside air barrier valve because that's allowing the outside air to come into that chamber. Then the valve on the other side is called the outer space barrier, barrier valve that's going to go up. That line goes up to the upper chamber, which is, quote, outer space. And then that, uh, that valve up there on the left of that top chamber is a valve and line to Earth's air chamber. And go over to the right, that valve is a barrier valve in line to the vacuum pump, which comes down here to the vacuum pump below. Okay, so that's the setup. So um, I'll, I'll probably talk through it a little bit too as it's playing, but uh, once you see this set up, and, and by the way, the all it's got the uh, pressure gauges here, they're both showing uh, all the way to the right, that's really 14 PSI. If it goes all the way to the, turns to the left, it'll be zero, it'd be a 100% vacuum or zero PSI. Okay, both of them right now are showing that it's 14.7 PSI. And literally, I'm pretty much at sea level here in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then once it's all, so right now, this picture showing that both chambers are at uh, 14 PSI. So what, before I, uh, what I'll do is close both the, Earth's air chamber valves closed. Okay, both the right and the left, I'm going to close it because I need to keep that air chamber at 14.7 PSI separate from the upper vacuum chamber when I turn on the vacuum pump. Okay. So we'll you remove the video? Yeah, go ahead and put the video up. So here's the setup. I'm just going to zoom in, show that both, both valves are open, so every, all the valves are open now so that both chambers have 14.7 PSI air pressure in them, okay? Just kind of show the hookup of the line going up top. And so all valves are open right now. And show that, that both both pressure gauges are at, at zero means it's at 14.7 PSI. Zero vacuum. And there's a line going to the vacuum pump. So next I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn on the switch on the vacuum pump. It took me a while for some reason to turn it on. So it'll be a little bit of a, uh, but you'll see I'm going to close these uh, valves at the bottom here. Closed now. See, I've closed off right there. There's two valves to the earth uh, chamber. And these are still open because I'm going to vacuum down that chamber, the quote, outer space chamber. You turn the pump on. And you'll see the upper chamber, the pressure will go down to zero PSI. I mean, zero, uh, it's, it's a full vacuum, full vacuum. Zero PSI. That's pretty good. Pretty fast. Wow, that's quick. Yep. I had to tap, tap the gauges because sometimes they get stuck. I don't know why, but just need to tap it a couple of times. Get it down. But it's going to go to minus 30, which is, is zero pressure. We'll put a little spaceman in there. Oh. Watch him blow die. up like a balloon. <laughs> yeah. So now that I get to the zero, uh, I get a full vacuum. I'm going to turn that valve right there, close it off. Now that both chambers are separate, okay? The upper chamber now has uh, zero PSI. The below, bottom one has 14.7. When I open the bottom valve, they're going to equal to about seven PSI because they're going to mix 50-50, what we expect, based on the thermodynamic law of pressure, different pressures combining. So I'm going to open up that left valve now. That's the barrier valve. Okay. No, outer space. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so see, it went to half pressure down there, and it went to... They're basically the same pressure. It's it equaled seven. out. Yep. Just and like. There you go. We have to have that barrier valve to, to maintain 14.7 PSI in the bottom chamber. So uh, this is the law that proves that out. <laughs> I actually thought about buying two more of these and just make it show it, make how much worse it can get. You know, it, yeah. it's easy to calculate. It's just, it is just a, you know, a, an equation that you can do this with. Yeah, I liked watching the experiments with these vacuums in the early days. That was one of my favorite things to watch.
because you had proof that it wouldn't work. Like they would put these, um, like they put uh, Stretch Armstrong inside of a vacuum and they even put Vacman. It was like this version of like, I don't know, like Stretch Armstrong's nemesis or enemy. And they, uh -huh. and it, it was one of those where you can suck the air out of them, but they would put him in a vacuum chainer, even with the air sucked out of them. And he would just balloon up so right. big. And I remember thinking, how did those astronauts going onto the moon not have that problem where you go from one environment to the next, you know, and just boom, um, expand. Yep. And I was oh, asking hey. people and they're like, well, their suits had to have accommodated that. I'm like, they're just cloth. You can watch them being made. They're not made out of metal. They're not like knights in armor. Like these are just regular suits. Yeah. And they're inside of a container that's three sheets of foil thick. Exactly. That's yeah, what they tell us. They say it's a, you had to be careful not to poke your finger through it. And you look at pictures, you're like, it looked like somebody did. There's obviously like wrinkles yeah. in the foil and um, that yeah, stuff, all, like, whatever kind of foil that is, you you can bungee jump with that stuff. Like it doesn't break apparently because a vacuum is powerful. And so, I mean, I, I would not with any suit on go inside of a vacuum no. chamber I, ever. No, like no. I think your, your saliva would start to boil. Like the oh, one, yeah. the one it actually happened. And um, when you watch the old videos, when they did it, the guy said his saliva started to boil and then he blacked out. And apparently right. there was allegedly something wrong with his suit and they saved him somehow. He, he didn't <laughs> die. And then um, they did this like uh, video in more recent times, like seven, eight years ago with a guy in a vacuum chamber sitting in there. He's like talking to this crew. And um, it was like, I, don't, I'm, I can't remember who did this, but um, the, the guy goes into the vacuum chamber and there's somebody there in like military gear watching him, but they only have like a fighter pilot fighter pilot helmet on. They're not like in a spacesuit, and right. they're watching. And they actually leave after the whole vacuum, after it started becoming a vacuum chamber, you know, environment. This person's mm -hmm. walking around in there. I'm like, their face, like they're yeah. they're exposed. Like it was yeah. so bogus, but people are like, nope. See, there's proof of a vacuum, and um, no, you could not have skin exposed in that environment. Like no. it. It's crazy build, how rough that is. You couldn't build a structure. You, there's no way these things that they go up with the rockets and stuff. It's all it's all fake. They don't go outside. We have a firmament. They can't even get past that. So it's yeah. all smoke and mirrors. But even uh, you know if they there's just no way because in in the full vacuum like that you cannot build a structure that will hold itself up. It'll just go like this. You just can't you know yeah can't do it. Um, and with a full vacuum, there's no there's no movement, there's no thrust, no combustion. And, you know, if I had put a mouse in that Earth's chamber and it would die it, when it combined it with the mouse would have died. It's yeah. 7, yeah. 7 PSI. So uh, that's a simple way to show all that, you know, and uh, another one that's simple to do, but they'll never show that or even bring that up in education. Yeah. And I saw a video. Somebody had a miniature rocket test going off in a vacuum. And they were trying to prove that it shows you that thrust could happen in a vacuum. But you see this little rocket just hanging there in the air and are in the vacuum, not in the air. It's just hanging by a, like a wire. And they got it to ignite in the vacuum, which is like almost impossible to get right. something to ignite in right. a vacuum because there's there's no air for ignition. Right. And so, um, but they were able to get ignition. I think they have to protect whatever's the... Um, the combustible product from mm -hmm. the vacuum. So you have to encapsulate it where there's oxygen and all that. Right. And so they were able to get combustion and the combustion shot out the backside of the rocket, but the rocket didn't move until the gases hit the back of the chamber and gave them something to push off of. So it was pushing off of its own gases, but it was stationary until the combustion reached the back wall. I yeah. wish I'd have brought that video on, but that was so cool to me to see that, if it wasn't for the back wall of that vacuum chamber, that rocket would have went nowhere. Right. But it needed that back wall to push off of. It needed something to push off of. Planes push off air, boats push off water. Like they exactly. need something. Yeah. And with the vacuum chamber, you don't have it's anything. And, yeah. yeah. And these these NASA rockets, whenever they do their little burst to go from 17,000 miles per hour to 17,000 miles, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. one one mile per hour faster. They had these little sprays. It's like psh, it was just like right. they're spraying water bottles out the side of their ship. There's no yeah. flames. There's nothing. It's just right. like you're spraying water out to go faster. It does not look like 
combustion at all. But they're like, yep, we're, we're doing a reboost, guys. Here we go. Now we're going 17,501 miles per hour. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to do some more things with the vacuum chambers I have. I, you know, I want to do, my wife, Teresa is like, you better not do that in the garage. You should do it outside. <laughs> you know, I'm going to make my own <laughs> rocket fuel, which would have the combustion capability. Right. Yeah. And then just put a little bit in there. Cause I actually bought a uh, laser that I can go through and ignite, ignite it. It'll go through the, the uh, plastic and ignite yeah. it. Pretty cool. You have, awesome. to wear, you have to wear some special glasses for that so you don't mess your eyes up. But, yeah, uh, get some slow-mo cameras. Yeah, yeah, that's down the road, but <laughs> that's I'm pretty awesome. busy with other stuff. So. Oh, yeah, you got a lot going on. You guys do a lot on the side. I'm sure you got your job, then you've got your, your ministry Yeah. and the math, all that. So get back to the uh, presentation. Yeah, let me add that back up there. There you go. Okay. So based on what we just had, here's the conclusion. The second law of thermodynamics states gases at different pressures will always combine to an equilibrium pressure. It is always scientifically calculable, testable, and repeatable. This law requires a barrier above the Earth's sky to maintain the perfect air pressure of 14.7 PSI at sea level for life to exist. And, you know, basically I say that same thing again. You know, if, it, if there was no boundary, there'd be no life on Earth. But Almighty God's scriptures state that there is a barrier above Earth's sky and his name, the firmament, is also called heaven. Hallelujah. Yes. Um, so I threw this in there again. We, we already talked about it, but this is NASA doing their thing right now, trying to keep their you know, agenda going with NASA's atmospheric per perturbations around Eclipse Path project. Um, when this, you talked about this earlier on, where the three rockets are going to go up and they're going to check out a lot of the, uh, um, you know, the um, ionosphere. But you already mentioned why they're called it that, because it's always going to be something with false gods and, and linked to Satan. So I'll just go to the next slide here. But this, I want to share this because I posted this up on uh, Facebook, my Facebook page. So I found out that this project is led by Aura Barjada. I don't know how to say that. He's a professor of engineering physics at uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. But I, but I found this, what he said in an article. Quote, if you think of an ionosphere as a pond with some gentle ripples in it, the eclipse is like a motorboat. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly rips through the water. And he said it creates a wake immediately underneath and behind it. And then the water level momentarily goes up as it rushes back in. So wait a minute. You mean the ionosphere is like a firmament hidden yes. through the deception? The firmament be be begins around the ionosphere? You know, so go well, here we go again. It's another indication that that's where the barrier is, but they just call it the ionosphere. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I couldn't believe he said that. It's like, wow. So if something hits it, you know, it might move around, but it's going to stabilize and get back to its normal state. The firmament that is. Yeah. You know? it, I saw the imagery. They used their data. It's always data and animations, but the data from the changes in the charges with the, during the eclipses, it did look like, a boat moving through the water um, mm -hmm. with that, with that change. And I thought that's weird that it has like that wake behind it. Yes. You know, if it was just a light in the sky, like so many things don't make sense right. with the globe model, the Elias effect where pendulums are changed that where it looks like there's something moving through water, the ripples we've right. seen in front of the moon, like all of these yep. things point to a firmament. Yep. Right. So, we didn't get a chance to watch this video in part two. I'm glad we're doing this because this will is another thing where the fake heliocentric model graphics diagram is a perspective. So I got a, I have it on there. Yes. Um, it's going to discuss, talk about these graphics because they never show these things in the right perspective, the right relational uh, sizes with each other or the distances that they are apart, the sun and the earth. So um, go ahead and play. Let me, is it the video on the bottom here? Um, this one? Hello, and welcome yes, to GeoTruth. Yes. That one? Yep. Okay, let me play that one. Today we're going to talk about NASA's fake heliocentric model. Here are a couple of typical fake heliocentric model graphics, diagrams, and perspectives. These graphics, diagrams, and perspectives are never scientifically, geometrically consistent, or correct in terms of the relative sizes of the sun, Earth and the distances between the Sun 
and the Earth. On the left graphic, the Sun is larger than the Earth, and on the right graphic, the Earth is larger than the Sun. Both graphics totally ignore the distances between the Earth and the Sun. The navigational data for the United States Naval Observatory is influenced by the, quote, spinning tilted spherical Earth elliptically orbiting the Sun, unquote, especially at latitudes near the, quote, poles. The NASAite's deceiving heliocentric model. The Sun is a gaseous fireball 870,000 miles in diameter. The Earth is a sphere slash planet 7,912 miles in diameter. The Earth rotates counterclockwise on a tilted axis of 23.44 degrees. The Earth orbits the Sun in a very slight elliptical counterclockwise manner between 91.4 million miles, which is the minor axis, and 94.5 million miles, which is a major axis, averaging 93 million miles. However, scientific observations of the quote stated unquote geometric sizes of the Sun and Earth and the quote stated unquote distances between the Earth and the Sun can be determined by using AutoCAD, which we will observe next. The quote stated unquote distances between the Sun and the Earth and their diameters are shown geometrically correct in AutoCAD. This allows us to observe and understand for ourselves the true geometric perspective NASA is stating. Due to the distance between the Sun and the Earth of, quote, 93 million miles, unquote, at a 93 million mile perspective, the Earth cannot be seen and the Sun is a small dot. Therefore, the sequence of AutoCAD views will start zoomed in on the Earth and zoom out to the 93 million mile perspective. Here we are zoomed in on the Earth showing its, quote, stated diameter of 7,912 miles, unquote. Now we will slowly zoom out to the, quote, 93 million mile, unquote, perspective. It's going to be a long journey. <laughs> I'll tell you why, it's just ridiculous when you see, when you see the true geometric geometric sizes of everything and what they say it's just crazy there's the pale blue dot that's us that's home <laughs> at this zoomed out perspective point the earth cannot be seen wow yeah you can't even see it nope here autocad is fully zoomed out and shows the quote 93 million mile unquote perspective the sun is a small dot now we will zoom in on the sun, showing its, quote, stated diameter of 870,000 miles. Here we are zoomed in on the sun, showing its, quote, stated diameter of 870,000 miles, unquote. Next, we will zoom out again to the, quote, 93 million mile, unquote, perspective and show the sun's light emanating on the Earth as perpendicular rays. Here we are zoomed in on the Earth again, showing the, quote, stated diameter of 7,912 miles, unquote, with the sun's light emanating on the Earth as, quote, perpendicular rays, unquote. As we observe the, quote, stated geometric perspective according to NASA, unquote, we see the distances between the sun and the Earth are extremely enormous compared to their sizes and result in the heliocentric model as a deception. Based on the foundational geometric law of water, it is physically impossible for the surface of water to bend or curve. Therefore, all shorelines of all oceans are at sea level, which requires the Earth to be a circular level plane, and it is. This foundational geometric law results in the heliocentric model to be nothing but a lie. 
so a lot of people don't really understand the perspective because they show these fake diagrams. It's just ridiculous. Oh, cartoons, you know? Yeah. That gives you a better idea of what that what they're saying. I mean, it's just the sun is so far away. It's ridiculous. Yeah, uh, you would not. It wouldn't make a difference on our seasons at that distance. Like you no. couldn't even see both of the dots when you zoomed out far enough. It was just right. Two tiny little dots, but this little tiny dot over here is causing four seasons on the one over there. Right. Exactly right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that puts it in a different perspective. That was a lot of work with the AutoCAD. I've never used that that program. I think I used uh, SketchUp to do 3D modeling and things a long yeah. time ago. But that is yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't like so I don't use miles. I just use units, but it still doesn't like it to be that big, you know, because got to zoom in and out. It's a lot of zooming in and out to get those perspectives the way they are to see them. Yeah. Wow. I imagine. Is this, is this the presentation? Is that it? Yes. Yeah. There we go. Okay. That was that. Um, all right. I just loaded up. So we're getting ready. We're going to talk again about now the uh, April 8th solar event. And I'm going to just show the summary of part one presentation where, you know, I showed, you know, for each location that I did from Waco, Texas, Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and then Sherbert, Quebec, uh, the, the actual location of the sun and moon from those particular locations and, and then showed a, a yellow line around the edge where, you know, anywhere else in that be able to see the sun or the moon is not geometrically lined up so if the moon is a mass that we should be able to see it but you'd never see the moon as a mass during a new moon because the moon has lost all of its light it's, it's closer to the sun and it's invisible so it's uh it's the one that's got the um can you see it there oh the video yeah this one yeah okay yeah, yeah this, is it. this is like an animation you have to kind of look at uh zoom in full screen guys when you're watching so you can see the the white dot near the red line, I think, is the sun, and then the black dot is the shadow of the moon. Is that correct by the green line? Yes, yes. And actually, okay. it's, it says sun. The uh, sun is yellow. The moon is white. Then that black line is basically the observation line to the particular location where it's going to be 100% uh, uh, eclipse. And that yellow line is any place on that inside that yellow line. They are not geometrically lined up. Like if you go south. Only time it would line up because the moon's more more north of the sun this time. This happens uh -huh. to be on this, and so on the north side of the uh, sun and moon, then the moon's going to be right now lined up to appear that it's blocking the sun. But if you go to any other perspective, especially opposite of when you go more south on that same uh, observation line, the sun and the moon are clearly apart from each other, as presented in part one. That tells you, okay, they're not lined up. So therefore, I should see the moon. Uh, yeah. But you know, because it's invisible. Moon, moon is just nothing but a light plasma that gains light when the sun goes farther away from the moon and loses light when the sun comes back around the moon. Okay. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see it. I'm going to hit play, and that way they can watch yeah. the animation. Yeah. So that's for Waco, Texas. You can turn off the sound if you want. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So it's showing you uh, how the sun's moving different times of the day for April 8th. You see, that's what it's doing that day. This is based on navigational data right off the uh, United States Naval Observatory. You can just see that there it goes. And that's, that's the same line they're showing, you know, on all the maps that they show you on the news and wherever on the websites things like that okay that's it wow yeah so that's just a quick summary of what part one was that part one was tons of geometry i know it i could see some comments that frustrated a lot of people it's like <laughs> i'm sorry can you do it in a five minute video it's like not really yeah you know i mean that's all i could do is that quick one right there this is the result of it but that's not going to tell yeah. them what's really going on, you know? Yeah. I was having flashbacks to why I failed high, uh, college algebra the first time around. <laughs> it's like, Oh yeah. I remember why now. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I pulled this up today. I thought, well, let's take a look at cult cultural beliefs of quote, solar eclipses. So the Chinese in ancient China, it was commonly held that solar eclipses occurred when a celestial dragon 
attack and devoured the sun. Well, yep. Dragon. <laughs> yep. It's a dragon again. Satan, that dragon of old, right? So this is uh, India, which is basically Hindu. According to legend, a cunning demon named Rahu sought to drink the nectar of the gods and thus attain immortality. Disguised as a woman, Rahu attempted to attend a banquet of the gods and was discovered by whoever? Vishnu. <laughs> As, as punishment, the demon was promptly beheaded, and it is his decapitated head flying across the sky <laughs> during the eclipse. It's like, wow, that's a, new one. that's a new one. I'm sorry if anyone believes that. I'm not laughing at you. That just cracks me up. Sorry. <laughs> so the Native Americans, according to Chowtaw legend, a mischievous black squirrel gnawing on the sun <laughs> caused the <an> eclipse. <laughs> I'm part Native American. I don't. I don't take too much offense to that. Yeah. Like the Chinese dragon, the squirrel must be frightened away by the clamor and yells of the events humans witness. So you know, I thought about that. It's like, well, what are we doing? What are, what's the world going to do on Monday? They're going to get together and we're yell and scream and, you know, give praise to this thing, right? Yeah. They're going to give praise to something they shouldn't be giving praise to. So the Egyptian one, and we talked about this in part two, because I went back to talk about, you know, when did the uh, quote solar event or solar eclipses start occurring? And I went back, uh, it, the Egyptians, the, although they were very oh, savvy sun worshipers, they did not leave any explicit records de detailing the solar eclipses. And in the part two, found out that it started to come about around the 16, 600s BC before Christ, that uh, a poet started quoting about Zeus being able to block the sun so it looks like it's nighttime. So it looks like historically uh, this event didn't occur until around maybe 8, 8 to 650 BC, which tells you it had to be built. It had to be built. Um, so here's another presentation that we really didn't walk through very well, but I want to do it now. Um, it's the Kona perspective, how Satan's black orb command and control center poses as a moon during, quote, solar eclipses. Um, so go ahead and, and bring that one up. I think that's the last video we have. All right. Is it? Should, should be the only this one. one. And welcome that's to it. G. Yeah. There you go. The truth. This presentation addresses how Satan's black orb, command and control center, poses as a moon during, quote, solar eclipses by using the same cone of perspective as the sun. Cone of perspective, how an object appears the same size at different distances. A cone of perspective is a visual perspective from an observation point well. where an object appears to be the same size regardless of how far away the object is from the observation point. This geometrically only occurs when the object's distance in miles and diameter in miles is the same ratio, which is distance divided by diameter equals ratio number. The cone of perspective diagram shown depicts this geometric law. All three objects shown in the cone of perspective appear to be the same size from the observation point, despite the fact that all three objects geometrically have different diameters and are different distances from the observation point. This occurs because all three objects have the same distance to diameter ratio of 10. Using the same distance to diameter ratio of 10, an object a million miles away from the observation point will have a diameter of 100,000 miles and will appear the same size as the other three objects in the cone of perspective. Any object with the same distance to diameter ratio within the cone of perspective will appear to be the same size. NASA, mainstream science, and Satan use this cone of perspective geometric law to deceive the world concerning the sun's and moon's distances from the earth and their diameters cone of perspective for the sun and moon. The upper table shows the distance from Earth and diameter of the sun and moon respectively, which NASA and mainstream science state. 
The distance to diameter ratio for the sun is 106.9 and is 110.58 for the moon. The lower table shows the distance from Earth of the sun and moon, respectively using the United States Naval Observatory navigational data and double triangulation. The sun's distance from the Earth is 3,107 miles, and the moon's distance from the Earth is 3,062 miles. Using the same distance to diameter ratio, 106.9 for the sun, the diameter of the sun is 29 or 30 miles. Using the same distance to diameter ratio of 110.58 for the moon, the diameter of the moon is 28 miles. The sun and moon are the same sizes, with the moon being 45 miles below the sun. First, Enoch tells us the sun and moon are the same size. Satan's Black Orb Command and Control Center uses the same cone of perspective as the sun to pose as the moon during, quote, solar eclipses, unquote. The distance to diameter ratio equals 106.9. Elevation of the first firmament slash heaven above Earth. The Kármán Line. The Kármán Line was established in the 1960s by the Federation Aeronautica International and has been used by members, countries, and organizations affiliated with FAI as one definition of space. The Kármán Line is a, quote, invisible boundary, unquote, around 62 miles above sea level where the Earth's sky ends and space begins. However, the second law of thermodynamics states gases at different pressures will always combine to an equilibrium pressure. Earth's air primarily consists of two gases which are 78% nitrogen and 20.9% oxygen at sea level. The air pressure at sea level is 14.7 psi pounds per square inch which is the perfect location for the human body to live due to the highest concentration of 20.9% oxygen in the air. With no boundary between the Earth's sky and space, the zero PSI, 0% oxygen vacuum of the, quote, infinite volume of space, unquote, will combine with the 14.7 PSI, 20.9% oxygen of the very limited volume of Earth's air to the equilibrium pressure of 0 psi, 0 percent oxygen, vacuum of, quote, space, unquote, and there will be no life on Earth. Therefore, the second law of thermodynamics requires a boundary above the Earth, which maintains the Earth's air pressure of 14.7 psi at sea level. This boundary is the first firmament slash heaven above Earth and is approximately between 60 to 100 miles above sea level. The Biblical Creation Model First firmament slash heaven is above Earth. The first firmament slash heaven above Earth is approximately 60 to 100 miles above sea level with waters above. Genesis 1, 7 to 8 Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. Jubilees 2.4 And on the second day he created the firmament in the midst of the waters, and the waters were divided on that day. Half of them went up above, and half of them went down below, the firmament that was in the midst over the face of the whole earth. And this was the only work God created on the second day. The Biblical Creation Model, Paradise, Mother Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, is located in the third firmament slash heaven. Paradise, Mother Jerusalem, and New Jerusalem are one and the same. 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4 I know all men in Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of it, I do not know. But God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or out of it, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. 
John 14, 1-2 Yeshua is speaking to his disciples. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Revelation 21, 2 I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Who is Yeshua? The biblical creation model, the sun and moon are located in the second firmament slash heaven. Revelation 12, 1 A great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed in the sun, with a moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Revelation 12.1 states the woman is a new Jerusalem with the sun and moon under her feet. The sun and moon are located in the second firmament slash heaven. Based on the United States Naval Observatory navigational data and geometric double triangulation, the sun is 3,107 miles above sea level and the moon is 3,062 miles above sea level. Next, we'll use AutoCAD to show geometrically how Satan's Black Orb Command and Control Center uses the same cone of perspective as the sun to pose as the moon during, quote, solar eclipses, unquote. This is the overall view of the sun's cone of perspective with its distance to diameter ratio of 106.9. The first firmament above the Earth is shown at 100 miles above sea level. The sun is in the second firmament and is 3,107 miles above sea level and is 29 or 30 miles in diameter. The distance to diameter equals 106.9. Since it is impossible for the inhabitants of Earth to go through the first firmament slash heaven, the distance from earth to the second firmament slash heaven is not known. Therefore, the line showing the second firmament slash heaven is representative to indicate the sun is in the second firmament slash heaven. Next, we will zoom in on Satan's black orb command and control center, showing that by using the same distance to diameter ratio of 106.9, the orb is in the sun's cone of perspective. This geometrically causes the orb to appear as the same size as the sun, posing as the moon, able to move in front of the sun, blocking the sun and the sun's rays. The orb is 90 miles above sea level, just below the first firmament slash heaven, and is 0.84 miles in diameter. We will now zoom out and follow the cone of perspective to the sun's location. We observe Satan's black orb is perfectly geometrically aligned with the sun's cone of perspective to pose as the moon during, quote, solar eclipses, unquote. Satan's black orb command and control Control center posing as the moon. Satan's extremely advanced technological spherical command and control center structure is where he oversees dominion and authority over the kingdoms of the earth with the following capabilities navigate and levitate at high elevations but below the earth's dome firmament. The firmament is approximately.
approximately 100 miles above sea level. Cloaking capability become hidden when required. Advanced weapons capability like direct energy weapons and the structure is approximately 0.84 miles in diameter to have the cone of perspective capability to block the sun and pose as the moon. During a new moon, which quote, solar eclipses unquote, always occur, the moon is closer to the sun, has no light, and is invisible. Therefore, it's impossible for the moon to block the sun or the sun rays. Satan himself reveals to the world by blocking the sun with his black orb command and control center posing as the moon during, quote, solar eclipses, unquote. Thank you for watching this presentation, and we hope... Yeah. It's kind of weird it was slow like that, but oh well. Are you on? Let me uh, mute myself. There you go. Um, <laughs> sorry, I tried to avoid having the squeaky chair con contributing to the background noise. Um, yeah, that was... Yeah, it was kind of slow. The video was kind of uh, breaking up. I think it. Yeah. Um, when you got things like this, I remember we were live. Uh, we had like more viewers than we ever had with this guy, former NASA NASA employee, and um, I was like, "Wow, we got a lot of people watching." And it just ended. Like the live stream just quit, and we really? had there was no reason. And he said, "Man, I've oh. been doing I've been doing live streams uh, for a long time, and this has never happened." It gave us a weird message, and we started back up, and the numbers dropped off. But I was wow. thinking. Uh, uh, we're blessed so far that hasn't happened here. Yes, we've been um, blessed. I'm glad there are a lot of people watching this because it's it's truth. You know, it's knowing some truth here, think about. You know. So let me just get back on the <laughs> PDF. What? So I was reading the comments. <laughs> All right, let's see. Is this one right here? There it is. Yeah. So I just did that. So what I actually did this a couple days ago. Uh, I decided I did this for last year, but I went, you know, on um, online where I could find out what the lunar cycles are for year 2024. So here are the lunar cycles. You know, there's 12 of them. If you look at on the first uh, column here, new moon, that those are the dates. You see the one in yellow, April 8th. That's that's a full eclipse, and then 2nd of October is another annular eclipse. Okay, but what's very interesting. And it happened. It happened last year too. I think it happens every year. You know, Enoch tells us in in uh, in his book about the moon, how it how it rotates, and and how the lunar cycles are. There's six months in a year that are 29 days, and six months that are 30. Okay. And so what I did on the right here, you know, you can add these up yourself, but it's got the days in between the uh, quarters of the moon for for the cycle. So. You can see it's 29 and 30. So I color coded the 30s to be blue and the greens, 29s to be uh, green. So you can tell it's six and six. It adds 354 days. That's what we hear about that in uh, uh, Jubilees and, you know, Dinky Enoch as well. It tells us that the, the moon is 10 days uh, slower than the sun right there. So part of this, there are 12 new moons in 2024. You know, there's on the list here. There are two solar eclipses in 2024, highlighted in yellow, and then I just said the same thing. So that's just what this is about, because we're going to get to why that's important, because of how we, we're told by NASA and mainstream mainstream science what's going on with the alignment between the sun, moon, and the and the, and the Earth. You've already shown that real early in the presentation, but uh, we'll keep going. So this is the uh, you got 12 new moons in year 2024 with only two solar eclipses, and then the one on, on the left is going to be the one for on Monday, uh, total solar eclipse. And then the one on the right is going to happen October 2nd, but it's down south. OK, just thought I'd share that. That's cool. And, you know, if you read if you read, uh, you know, NASA, it says, yes, solar eclipses happen once every six months. OK, so it's interesting and it is working here. This is the the line of the path and the dark, the dark area is the path that's uh, 100% total solar eclipse. Um, and it's just a very, very narrow path compared to the rest of the United States. Um, so I dug back into the information I did on part one and just pulled this out real, real quick to 
explain what's going on at each location. Duration of the solar event and duration of totality, okay? So for Waco, the duration of the solar event is two hours and 40 minutes, but the totality is only four minutes and 14 seconds. Very, very short, okay? And that's when it's at 100% obscuration. That's where people can say, oh, I see the stars, you know, it's totally dark. Uh, so in Indianapolis, Indiana, the duration for the solar event is two hours and 32 minutes, and they have three hours and 50 seconds of uh, totality. Here in Pennsylvania, the total solar event is two hours, 28 minutes, and three minutes, 44 seconds of totality. Up in Sherbrooke, Canada, duration is two hours and 21 minutes with a totality of three minutes and 26 seconds. Just thought that's a data point people should understand. When at your location, that's the only time you're going to see that it, it it's going to make it dark because even at 99%, it looks like almost like a regular day that because the sun's brightness, once that orb moves out of the way just a little bit, it's back to a, a normal day. So that's why it's such a short duration. This 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 particular solar uh, eclipse or event is probably about the twice twice as long as the one that occurred in uh, what was it August seventeenth or two, uh, two thousand it was in two thousand seventeen. There was about half that time for that so, total solar eclipse when it was coming across from the west to the east. So I, I found this. I think I found it today because. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Yahweh just kind of inspires me and puts ideas in my mind. I check them out and I find more information. It's just beautiful. Locations of 99% obscuration experience a total overcast day. I go, what? So this guy, Mr. Fred Espinak, is a retired NASA astrophysicist who has experienced 30 total solar eclipses. Below are statements in an article from him. He says 100% obscuration or nothing. In other words, you need to be at 100% in that totality, because he says there's such a radical dramatic difference between a 99% partial and 100% total. There's no comparison. During a total eclipse, the sky darkens suddenly and dramatically, the temperature drops, the stars come out. So I highlighted this, even at a 99%, it gets no more dark than on a typical overcast day. In other words, you wouldn't even know it. If you didn't know, and you were at 99%, you wouldn't know what was going on, that there was a quote, a solar event going on. It's only in that narrow path. Yeah. I would love to see pictures of the stars at that time. Like what stars are we seeing? Right. You know? Like I bet the Southern cross would be up, you know, like what's up there like, yeah. at that time. That'd be so cool right. to see. Then he says you can have a 75% or 80% partial solar eclipse. And, and if you didn't know what was happening, you would might not even notice because the environment doesn't even change. Hmm. So, you know, now I'm going to go to a chart here that, uh, <laughs> News media's sun's obscuration map, extreme exaggerations and lies. If you look at this, I mean, look, you see the path of the total eclipse, right? That's the 100% obscuration. But then as soon as you go out of that to like 99% to 80%, look how they're showing it's so dark still, right? It, it should be no change in darkness, but they're lying. Because when you get past that 100% obscuration, it's just an overcast day. There's, you, yeah. you didn't even know it. Something's going on. And they did this all the way out, all the way out. They're showing it like that. You can tell the difference. No, that where it's over here, where it's like white, 20 percent. It That's what it should be right at the at line of the where it goes to 99 percent. This whole area from 20 percent to 99 percent should be white because it's only where it's going to show it dark is in that totality path. So this is a, this is a. a, a graphic of lies and to kind of people get hyped up. Okay. It doesn't have that impact like they're trying to show here. Yeah. Wow. So now this is what kind of what you were showing earlier. So we're going to go through this. This is the graphic deception of a solar eclipse during a new moon. So um, you see the sun over here to the right. It's got just peeking out a little bit, you know, it's a little bit of yellow there. And then you see the moon in the middle. And they're showing the moon as a mass, like they would typically would do, that it's a mass and that the light is just on the opposite side, facing away from the globe Earth. But then look in here. <laughs> They've got two things. You've got uh, Aryan path of a prenumbral shadow sees partial eclipse. All right. So they're kind of in a way telling you the truth. This would be the truth. And I'll show it in the next slide. If the sun's rays are parallel, 
that whole dark area there would be all the way out to these edges here where they say it's just a partial eclipse, right? Mm -hmm. Right? But then they show you the area path of the umbral shadow total eclipse. Well, they're kind of telling you right here, just that video I did, this is a cone of perspective. <laughs> yeah. That's the cone of perspective. The orb, and I'll show you that later on. But so they're telling you uh, truth and lies here on this one <laughs> picture. There's a truth and there's a lie. Okay. So correct a graphic during a new moon is if we consider the moon as a solid mass, we get rid of all, I just X out all this stuff up here. And then I put on top, well, here comes the sun's parallel rays because the sun is a solid mass. So it hits it, but then here's a full shadow. The full shadow should hit this part of the earth, same, same diameter of the moon, if it was a mass, right? Two thousand, what we think, they tell us it's 2,000 miles, 2,160 miles in diameter. So it should have a 2,000, it should cover much of the United States, the shadow, but it doesn't in reality. So the bottom here, solar eclipses should occur in 2024 during all 12 new moons. Because we have, he's only, this is only happening on two new moons because he's using the cone of perspective where he's going to get in front of it. The other 10 new moons, we should see this happen. We should see this diameter of full shadow width uh, coming from the moon because it's doing the same thing. It's doing exactly the same thing. So we should have, all 12 months should have this full uh, dark shadow. It would be just like for 2,000 miles, you'd be able to see the stars in a diameter. But you don't. Okay? I hope people are seeing the impact on this visual here. That all, all 12... Uh, months of the lunar cycle when it's a new moon this should be what occurs a huge full width shadow of 2,000 miles on the earth where you could be able to it's a full total eclipse if the moon was a solid mass but it's not it's invisible it's huge right there so now I've corrected it correct graphic during a new moon since the moon is invisible okay so I crossed out the sun over there <laughs> It's not that far away because we know through the navigational data that I've shown over many, many presentations that I move the sun. See, it's closer. It's behind the moon. So I moved it closer. It's in alignment with the moon. I crossed out the globe Earth. It just said circular level plane Earth. Uh, then you see I placed Satan's black orb command and control center posing as the moon close to the Earth in that cone of perspective. So now we're seeing the truth here for those two months. This is what's happening in the two months. It's the cone of perspective. That's why it's only a pinpoint area, only 100 and some miles on, on the flat plane Earth, where it should have been, if it's even on the circular level plane Earth, it should be a diameter of 2,000 miles, which is most of the uh, United States. So, you know, Two solar eclipses occur in 2024 due to Satan's black orb command and control center moving in front of the sun posing as the moon. But during all 12 new moons in 2024, the moon has 0% light, is invisible, and therefore cannot block the sun or the sun's light. So he picks whatever. You know, I don't think he can't control. Yahweh controls the sun. He's, he's given the sun and the moon orders or laws to go by, and that's how they circle. They circle around the sun is the clock. And that sun's clock is the same for every year. It is a 364-day year. It's doing the same pattern, okay? I, and I haven't really looked at the moon. I think that's going to be my next study thing, which is going to take me hundreds of hours to do too. Start mapping that out to see what kind of cycle it has. But uh, Satan knows that cycle because he was here. I mean, he, him and the angels were here to see. They, they were created day one. So they saw how... The father placed the sun and the moon and the stars within the heavens, okay, and how they run. So he knows how they move. He can't control them, so he takes advantage of when they're certain times. He knows when they're going to be lined up like they can be like on Monday. And it doesn't seem to happen very often. Otherwise, he might do it more, I would think, right? Um, so this is a big deal. I mean, this these last three slides, people can use these and realize, ah. Oh, that's what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go back to scripture now again. Oh, this is, uh, you know, there are unique occurrences in Yahweh's scriptures concerning the sun and the moon. 
Almighty Yahweh stopped the sun and moon for one full day in Joshua's time. You know, um, Joshua 10, 12, 14, because Joshua had a huge battle going on and he wanted to finish it before the sun went down. So on that day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel. He, he prayed, O oh, oh, oh sun, stand still over Gibeon, O oh moon, over the valley of Ajion. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance upon its enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down for about a full day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord listened to the voice of a man because the Lord fought for Israel. Wow. There's the answer right there for that one. Have no fear. <laughs> yep. And I've seen some uh, uh, some information online, and it's all lies that they're trying to use that time, saying that well, a solar eclipse ha happened that time when the sun stopped. It was just the moon, uh, the moon blocking the sun. It's and that's a lie. The Lord, the Lord stopped the, the sun and the moon's movement literally for a full day. Now I don't know if he started them up. He moved them back to where they should have been, you know, on the regular cycle, probably, you know. So Almighty Yahweh caused the darkness because Yeshua, his only begotten son, the light of the world, died. So basically, you know, when uh, Yeshua was on the cross and uh, that starting, and we'll read it here, that, um, well, I didn't finish yet, but Satan's black orb can only cause full darkness, 100% obscuration for a maximum time of four minutes at a specific location and not three hours like we're going to see this Monday, right? It can only block a location for four minutes and then it's it's done. Yep. You could be die for nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Matthew 27, 45, from the sixth hour, which is 12 noon, until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., darkness came over all the land. Luke 23, 44, 45. It was now about the sixth hour, 12 noon, and darkness came over all the land until the third, ninth hour. The sun was darkened, which means obscured. And the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. So Yahweh darkened the, the sun. He could have turned down the light of it. He could have put some dense, dense, heavy clouds for darkness because he basically turned away not to see his sun. So that's also a term of light going because Yahweh is all light as well, right? Um, so those two occasions here, uh, basically it's still Yahweh manipulating sun and moon for his own reasons for this. So I'm just going to go back to the basics. This is kind of, this is a, re, as a re, uh, review now of Yahweh's laws of the sun and moon. Uh, so, you know, when Genesis 1, 14 to 18, you know, he says the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. They, they rule and sun always rules the day. The, the moon is never going to get in the way of the sun because whenever the moon gets closer to the sun, it has no light and it's invisible. And during the night, the sun is always going to be, because uh, the, the moon is slower, the sun's always going past it or to it, past it or to it. And that happens on a new moon. So whenever that happens, uh, the sun's still in control. Because uh, uh, when it's nighttime for a, a new moon, you won't see this, the moon anyway, so the sun's not blocking it. It's just the electromagnetic relationship between the two, right? And then uh, Jubilees 2, 8 to 10, basically, uh, you know, he says he created the sun and the moon to rule over the day and the night. And here again, it's very specific. There's rules that the laws that they will, they do their courses, but they don't get in the way of inter interfere with each other. Um and we did this one previous too, but you know, people can read the, uh, you know, Enoch 41.5 and 41.7, but 41.7 is very, very good because after this is the hidden and visible path of the moon. So he's telling you that the moon is hidden, which is the new moon and visible path when it's starting to get light, full light or back to zero. That's the visible path. That's any time other than the new moon. And it travels the course of its journey in that place by day and by night. One stands opposite the other in front of the Lord of Spirits, and they give thanks and sing praise and do not rest because their thanksgiving is like the rest rest to them. 
So I really highlighted this, that what we just read, always hitting, during, hidden during a new moon phase and always visible during all other moon phases at various levels of illumination. It's right there. Wow. Enoch is so, a good one for the uh, studying of the moon, the moon's yeah. path, the sun, the gates and the firmament. Yeah. Enoch is a great read to yeah. understand how it works. Right. And again, if anybody wants to, uh, you know, I did a 31, uh, 31 videos, a playlist that about uh, watching each day, the moon's lunar cycle uh, from September, 20, September 29th last year to October 28th. And it'll show you the videos and, and uh, pictures each day, how the moon's light is either gaining or, or losing. And you can see, because I can zoom in really close with the, the um, camera, that when it loses its light, uh, you can actually see part of the light still not touching the moon, and then there's nothing but darkness between it. So it's, it's some kind of plasma. It's not a, it's not a mass because you see ripples and little specks of light that are not attached to the rest of the light main part of the moon. It's it's there. It's and that's the, that's the visual observation through constantly looking at the cycle every day. Now there are a couple of days that it rained, so I couldn't do it, but I could still locate the sun based on the navigational data. And so I'd still show it on the map where they were and how much illumination level it is, because, again, Satan can't change that. That's those are laws by Yahweh. He controls that. Satan has to live, live with it. Yeah. So I just did this summary chart here again. It's, it's the, um, you know, the last thing about how the cone of protection takes. He uses his orb to pose as the moon since the moon is invisible. That's it. Nice. Good breakdown. Yeah, it's it's cool seeing unique perspectives of how this stuff works. Because right, I am not mathematical with things. I'm very visual, and when I see things, I can understand it. And so that's very, very good to have all those visuals and as well as the math aspect of it as well. Right. But those let those the three uh, charts that I showed. You know where mm -hmm. they're showing both the cone of perspective in there, and then the shadow, the full width shadow. Just those three charts, if somebody can look at those, they should see what I'm talking about, that, um, you know, they're lying right there, having yeah. both at the same time. Yeah. So awesome. If you guys have any questions, uh, like like uh, Debbie says here, type them in cap, all caps, make them capitalized so we can see them. Wish it was like the old days. We could have call-ins, you know. <laughs> still do that on here. I'm just nervous about that. I don't know why. For some yeah. reason, I'm nervous about having call-ins and sending out the careful. link publicly to everybody. Right. You never know. You have to have that 15-second delay. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I would have to have the NASA delay. <laughs> right. Yeah, because I've got a lot of haters. And um, many of them, they don't show up because I've already blocked them. So, like, they're probably mm -hmm. still there. Um, I try. Right. And I would give so much lenience and forgiveness and patience. And it's just like, after a while, I'm like, all right. Once they're attacking other people, then that's where I have to draw the line. I'm okay if they're slandering me. Or, right. Um, but if they slander somebody like a guest or my wife or somebody, then it's like, you're done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah hands off, buddy. Yeah. yeah. It's a different scenario. So the other yeah. thing, too, I'm going to follow up. You know, obviously, a lot of people are going to be on Monday and looks like here in Myrtle Beach, the weather looks like it's going to be pretty good. So, uh, yeah. I'll do my thing. I've already got coordinates, what's supposed to happen, you know, for the azimuth and altitude angles and things like that and uh you know um see what i can uh I'll probably do a little short thing after that of what what i i noticed you know yeah yeah i've thought about filming it i don't know that day is sort of like a special day you know for us like a, a sabbath day pretty much and so it's like yeah because it's the last it's your last uh yeah it's right it's the last uh unleavened bread day yeah yeah. So I, to me, it's like, should I film it? You know, probably, yeah. I don't know. I might, I'm tempted to, but at the same time, it's like, no, I just want to enjoy my day and not even worry about it at all. There's going to be so much film of this thing. Yeah. Never from space though. We're not going to see the ISS that's allegedly going around every 90 minutes, having perfect opportunities to view it. Sending that's, us a, that's, any, a, that's in a big pool anything. somewhere. It's in a pool. Yeah. <laughs> so, I would like that. Like if I was them, I would be up there going, guys, we're going to live stream this and you're going to see how cool it is. And oh, they're, yeah. they're like, no, we're not going to do that. Right. All those thousands of satellites, we're still not going to do that. You know, like, come on, give us something. Nope. 
Remember that movie Gravity that they put out on purpose with uh, yeah. Sandra Bullock? I mean, there's a, like all the styles of stuff, all the stuff going on. And something gets hit and it breaks. Like they're trying to make it look real. Yeah, it looked pretty real. Like some of the movies, they do a good <laughs> job. And NASA, they're doing better. They've they've corrected a lot of their their errors with the wire harnesses, you know, masking right. effect going away and all that. Like they're they're getting better. Right. And there, there's a time when we're not going to be able to tell. They're really working to get it to where they can do this stuff. And the live conversations were are a big deal because th when they first started doing them, they were messing up. And now they're getting yeah. to where it's like they don't move. They stay in front of the camera. They make sure they're very careful um, not to mess up, not to say um, we're across the country from where we're talking to you right now. You know, those sort of uh, bloopers. They try not to say those things. Um, I mean, everything's blue screen or green screen, so they could be right next yeah. door in another studio with them. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, lying signs, part of the lying signs and wonders that they're right. doing, I think. Right. We got Brother Steve Martin from Assembly of Yahweh, uh, North Alabama. I got to meet this man twice. Awesome, man. I'm learning a lot from this brother. He's uh, he's come a long way, his his testimony, where he's he was a um, Baptist preacher, and now he's his walk is just powerful. It's amazing yeah. how much he's learned in these last days. So I'm mm -hmm. learning a lot from you. We got we have his videos playing weekly now. It's cool, cool, humble. And uh, truth seeking man, mm -hmm. Tyler Porter in the house. A lot of cool people, awesome people. Somebody said, Please explain. This is Judy McCullough. This is yeah. for you, George. Please explain Satan's Black Orb. Where did that, where'd you find that information? Because, yeah, that's something I'm on the fence about. I'm not saying, right. like, guys, believe it right. in Satan's Black Orb. Um, there's this is a it's, it's something that makes sense to a lot of people, and right. Um, well, I guess it's probably just about it, 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 it deducing things like when, if, if you understand the, uh, the physical and electromagnetic relationship between the sun and the moon, which is actually in first Enoch tells you what's going on with the, the cycles of the lunar cycles, how, you know, when the sun's and sun and the moon are farthest apart, the moon is bright. And so when they're together, the light's out of it and there's nothing there. So if there's not, nothing there, which is invisible, and through all of my video investigations that I did uh, for that lunar cycle for, for uh, that I did back in the fall, uh, I know that the moon is, it is invisible during a new moon. So something is going across it. And in nowhere in any of Yahweh's scriptures does it talk about another entity that he created that would actually be able to go in front of a the sun and block it out. So, you know, Satan is the, the deceiver of deceivers, oh. distractor of distractors. And a lot of it has to do with um, technologies that we are, we don't have the technologies. We're, we're, since Satan is the prince of the air, and he said that in scripture when uh, Yahushua was basically uh, tempted by him, and one of the times he was tempted, he, he took him up to a high place. High place where he could see all the kingdoms of the earth at once. And it's like, well, you can't do that on a globe map because you can't see the underside. So this also points to uh, a circular level plane. Okay, so yeah. he's up there. And then uh, Prince of the Air, Satan says, you know, if you bow down, bow down and worship me, I will give you all these kingdom kingdoms because it's been relinquished to me. It's been given to him. Yahweh's allowing him to do this. Uh, and he can give it to anybody he wants. Jesus ignored that. He said, uh, you know, away from me. You know, you shall only worship the one true God, Yahweh. Um, and so when it says a high place even there, well, uh, it can't just be a mountain. The mountains are not tall enough. You, Mount Everest, you can't see the whole circular level plane. You've got to be way, way up there real high. So, you know, you have to kind of look at that a little bit deeper. It's like, well, how do you get up there? Because you uh, Yeshua was a man. He was fully flesh and blood. He's not like an angel. Uh, so Satan somehow probably carried him up there, it moved him, got him up there to look at it. And uh, then since he was flesh and blood, he couldn't come down. Angels, angels, Yahweh's angels brought him back down. So once you know, if you watch the old Star Trek movies, I don't know how old you are, Judy, but uh, I watched the Star Trek movies way back when they first came out, you know, when I was young and I was really into them. So they were showing all the technologies back then that they actually have, but they don't let the masses know about it because Satan's in control pretty much of everything in the world. If you look, he controls everything, literally.
He's allowed to control everything. Uh, in some of the previous presentations, I show a whole list of everything, frankly, what you could think of that's part of the world. He's got influence on it. And so, uh, you know, in Star Trek, way back then, they had cloaking devices, they had lasers. Uh, they could beam me up, Scotty. Well, you know, angels can do that. Angels can go from spirit being in heaven and come down here and be a physical body, a body that you can touch and they can eat. So there's technology there. A lot of it's the, the creation that happened with Almighty Yahweh. He has an ether here, which is made up of energy, vibration, and frequency. And these play a lot into uh, technologies that the angels know about, and certainly Satan. Uh, and not only that, but Satan has an army of unclean spirits. So uh, they have technologies that we don't know about. I mean, I, maybe you've seen some clips of these UFOs, you know, that you, you can see these clips. These things pop up and they go, they go real fast. We don't have that technology, but some, I think there's some uh, people that are demon possessed that have that ability because it's, they're given to by the demons to them to make these things. They create this high level technology. If you looked at the uh, one of the slides, it says what technology he has. He can levitate, you know, uh, uh, because he's taken advantage of the ethers, uh, electromagnetic energy to reverse charges so he can levitate now instead of falling to the earth by uh, uh, the charges, you know, trying to bring it down, it's going to repel it and go up. So that's what's happening. I don't know if you've heard about mercury engines or not, mercury, vor mercury vortex engines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are something that's extremely technological and apparently is has been known. So there's just a lot of technology there that's been hidden. And you look at some of the movies like Star Wars, you know, they're not just telling you about the Death Star for just for entertainment. They're telling you what's really going on. Yeah, someone said, I, I remember watching a whistleblower video back when I was way before uh, Biblical Earth stuff about NASA being a cover up for the amazing technology that they had, the Babylonian technology, that this advanced stuff that we would, they're going to market as alien technology if you know sure. where we find it. Right. Um, but it's stuff that they don't want us knowing. That's why they've had great resets in the past. It's it's not to hide the millennial reign. It's there. They can't have us getting too far along and using some of that technology, that wisdom of the fallen technology, right. things that people were hungry to learn. Like it says, um, I think in Jubilees, they were hungry to learn these things, or maybe that's um, Enoch. I'm trying to remember no, those Jubilees. And so they found a lot of that writing on engraved in stone. And so the fallen left their writings in the stone for people to look that up and mm -hmm. um, bring back that technology, bring back that wisdom. Of course you have these unclean spirits, you know, using their puppets right now. Mankind could not pull off the deceptions you're seeing right now that are worldwide, with the globe being one of them without right. the help of these beings that have been around forever, these powers of darkness that have right. been around since the flood, you know, doing what they're doing, or pre-flood, I should say. Right. So, yeah, um, Mountain Man said, what text can I read? I don't know if there's any good books on it, but uh, Tyler Porter in the chat was sharing some links to um, Sean Griffin on the YouTube channel is called Kingdom in Context, and he has a series called Investigating Babylon. Right. And so you can watch that. It's 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 lengthy. It's a lot of videos, but it'll show you right. um, step by step how this is possible. And so um, could it be a lying sign and wonder? One of those like the mystery Babylon um, orb of Satan. It right. could be. Um, so so it makes it seem yeah. definitely in the realm of possibility. But I'll just fall back on the fact that when you look at uh, Yahweh's creation and what the sun and moon were designed to do, that during a, a new moon, there there's no moon visible. So something's blocking it, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's not it's not mentioned in any of Yahweh's scriptures. Sun, yeah. moon, and stars is what he created. That was it. Yeah, lights in the firmament yep. for signs and appointed times. Yep. Right. It's what they are, and he set them in the firmament. Oops, I just missed. Um, oh, he put it in the uh, chat. Yeah. Say so we got Earth first, space later here. A local fellow truther, awesome young man. Got to meet him. So many people. We're trying to have a meetup um, soon, but the the places we usually reserve are not 
letting us reserve them until like June or July. So I'm going to try to find another place mm. to have one sooner than July. I don't want to wait until July to have a meetup. You guys are getting hungry for that. Pull, yeah, they pulled off the plan. Didn't might, they? might try to come down and be part of that when, you know, let us know. Yeah, get you to. They're awesome. Meetups are awesome. If you're in an area where you feel lonely and secluded, use your resources, use the apps, you know, the Flat Earth, mm -hmm. Sun and Moon app, whatever you can, and just have a little gathering. Even if it's seven or eight people or five people, truth seekers, it makes um, a difference. It makes you feel like you're not alone. Even right. And people are willing to travel. We had one and people were traveling from Minnesota all the way to north, yeah. you know, to Tennessee. We had it in Tennessee, even though we live in Georgia. We had people traveling from all, all over Colorado. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, you name it, they were traveling here. And, mm -hmm. and it was a blessing seeing all those people. It's like a, a, a precursor to when we all unite once and for all. It's so much right. fun. So I don't know if, uh, I don't know if this is going to be seen, but here is uh, tons of uh, Hollywood movies basically portray a sphere. I don't know if I can probably not going to do it but oh yeah you know there's so many movies that show the the black rubber sphere so they're really big into that uh many of the companies that are controlled by uh satan they their uh, logos or eclipses i mean it's everywhere i've i've done a couple of uh uh yeah videos uh, a couple times and again and we can talk about lunar, but uh, so if you've seen my presentation based on the navigational data, uh, we're on a circular level plane. The sun is always at 3,107 miles above sea level, rotating clockwise. And then the moon is a little bit below that, 3,062. So they're both circling the same elevations on their own around. So when a lunar eclipse happens, which, by the way, a lunar eclipse is... All eclipses are are not real. But we talked mainly about the new moon, which is uh, when it's new moon, that's when the solar eclipses happen. They're not eclipses. The lunar eclipse, they say that uh, the Earth is in between the sun and the moon. Well, we've already proved that the Earth is a circular level plane and both the sun and the moon are above it. So there's never going to be an eclipse. What's happening on a lunar eclipse, if you notice, it's always going to be on a full moon. Okay? So it happens on a full moon. When that's when that occurs, the sun and the moon are 180 degrees apart from each other on a circular level plane. They're, they're 180 degrees because the farthest the sun is from the moon, the moon is fully charged. And occasionally when we have we see the moon do some type of a light sequence, we don't know what it is, but I think it could be some type of a sign from Yahweh when that happens. But it does seem like it 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 it, it kind of pulses its light and changes a little color and then goes back to normal yeah, sorry sorry but i've noticed sometimes though uh there's different types of lunar eclipses or i'd say uh full moon mm -hmm. occurrences when the lunar eclipse could happen uh when that it's just again it's it's a light change by the moon itself i don't know why and i'm not quite sure if there's anything in, in the in god's word that talks about that you know we talk about certain ordinances and things like that um but when it when it's a full moon one of two things happening either the sun's going down or the moon's going rising up or vice versa right so it depends one time when i was videoing it taking pictures um the sun was uh setting and the moon was coming up but when it did its light thing the light was on the opposite side when it did its little sequence. It was on the opposite side of the, of the sun, on, on the moon. So that should never have happened, you know. Mm -hmm. wow. Let's see, any more questions? The reason I asked about the filming, the reason I asked, I saw the lunar eclipse go from a full moon to a gray orb, one-tenth in size. Hmm. Did you get that on video? I'm not sure if they did. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm. I, are you going to be filming it? I think that's the main thing they were asking. Are you going to be filming it and trying to capture anything? I think the you might have already answered that. Yeah. Um, or the I solar wonder. eclipse. I'm sorry, the solar. Oh, does he mean solar? I think. Oh, he said lunar. Oh, did he? Lunar. Okay, lunar. He did. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not sure what was happening there because um, the uh, full moon again, like I said, is a is opposite the sun, and um, is always at the same elevation, so it shouldn't be changing much in a 24 hour period, uh, or yeah. in, even you know what, what, however long the moon the full moon's out for that night before it mm -hmm. goes away. It's Can we tell anything? I'm trying to get all the questions here. Can we tell anything from the duration of the eclipse across the USA? Are you talking about the total duration when it goes from uh, like around Texas and then all up past into uh, Canada? Is if that's what the question is? Um, let's see. I can. We had. We had. I had the durations at each location, right? And that's just only because the sun is rotating clockwise. The shadows are going that way. So it's it's probably a little less than three hours total on the United States. And I, I just went to, I didn't go farther south than Waco. I went from Waco to Sherbrooke, Canada. So it was about two hours and 40 minutes, I think was the total duration. Yeah. I wonder what that'll be like out on the ocean, people going out in that path on the ocean. That'd be interesting. I didn't think about that and all those boats in the water. That'd be cool. Really gonna mess with the fish. <laughs> yeah, we need to repent. Awesome. Um, good questions. That thank you guys for being respectful in the chat and keeping people in check. I've, I've seen I always observe that during these things. People are putting people in timeout and doing that, <laughs> doing a good job um, protecting protecting everyone from all the the nonsense things that go mm -hmm. on the attacks the spiritual attacks there's spiritual warfare going on with all these right. things I and mean, we have people right. literally around the world watching so you never know mm -hmm. what angle i know we've got trolls that yeah that have done have done things outside of youtube they've come after us at our jobs you know like tried to get us in trouble at work calling central office saying stuff you know the it's ridiculous the links people would go through to so, try to bring you down spiritually, but it, in reality, it just makes you. Um, no, you're doing the right thing. Fired up, and yeah, you know you're on the right track. Right. Yeah. Well, heck yeah, it's been a blessing. We've been going live for over two hours, I think, two hours and yeah. seventeen minutes. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, this is a good way to end our Sabbath, and yes, now it's um, about time to get back to work. I'll be, I will be taking Monday off, so that'll be nice to. Whatever happens with all their planned deceptions and things they got going on, be at peace. Don't worry about it. Right. It's, it's going to be, right. just let it be a relaxing day for you. Don't freak out. Don't expect to see anything crazy. Um, it yeah. would be nice, though. I, I, I'm i always like, man, I just wish this was like time for the resurrection. Let's go. I know a lot of people are feeling <laughs> that way. Like, let's go. First resurrection. Here we come. Yeah, well, yeah. 2030 is kind of an interesting thing that the UN's, you know, Got some marker there, so yeah, close and, to that. Yeah, and the um, Antarctic Treaty I saw. I was looking into that again today. It expires in 2040, along with something else. And I thought, man, it's so fascinating that the 2040s are just kind of like, ah, we're gonna drop our guard a little bit with this stuff. Like they know something's gonna happen, right? Um, or they don't really know. They can't change anything, but they're pretty sure there's significant times ahead. That's why they're yeah. ramping up all this lawlessness. Right. Like the word tells us, there's going to be a lot of lawlessness. For sure. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and let you all get back to your lives. Let George get back to his awesome wife. And I'm going to go and um, spend some time with the family. Got my, my grandson just got, just came over. So go see him. I'm a grandpa now. <laughs> You're too young for that. <laughs> I know I am. I'm too young and immature to be a grandpa. It is not right. <laughs> He doesn't know I'm his granddad yet. I'm afraid yeah. to tell him. That's cute. Yeah. All right. Well, we will see you guys around real soon. Hopefully, if something cool happens, we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Right. Um, but yeah. Thanks, George. Thanks again for sharing all of your knowledge. It's been sure. a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, brother. All right. We will see you guys around real soon. All right.